coming in today. This is the 15th talk in our series organized by the Teachers Against the Climate Crisis. And it's a particularly good day to have a talk. We, I should just point out that we actually met for the first time exactly one year ago. On 7th of September, about 10 to 12 of us met in a room in Dayal Singh College. So it's actually been exactly one year. So I'm very glad that we're having this talk today. Uh, and I would say that it's in some ways it's been uh, one of the strangest years in my lifetime and possibly in many of our lives. And through this, I think we managed to do a reasonable amount of work. And part of that work and part of what's kept us going uh, has been this talk series of which today is the 15th. So thank you, Devika. I'm glad we are having this talk today. Uh, so with those few words, uh, let me just pass on to Lavanya Suresh. And thank you once again for joining in. Thanks a lot, Madhavan. So, uh, it would be great pleasure today in introducing our speaker, uh, who's Professor Jay Devika. She is with the research unit on local cell government at uh, CDS uh, Kerala. So, Devika was trained as a historian, but she now brings that training to bear on contemporary issues. But she's a very prolific and erudite writer, and she writes both in Malayalam and English, and she translates between the two languages as well. And she often uh, has uh, commentaries on Malayali society on Kapila online. And right now, she's actually set up this really interesting website where she's translating uh, Malayali feminist work. Uh, I'm sure I'm not going to pronounce this very well, but it's a really interesting website. I can put it up on the comment uh, called Swatya Rindi, I think. All right. Uh, her feminist writing has inspired a <laughs> generation. Yes, I can't pronounce it. I can't pronounce it. <laughs> I'll put the link. So her feminist writing has inspired a whole generation of scholarship. And uh, personally, I love her work on Kudumbushri, which has been very influential. Uh, so this particular talk for this particular group is really fascinating. I think because of this, uh, uh, this fact that when we talk of climate change, uh, climate change, we know we're on a perilous path. And we're walking on that path with our eyes wide open. Uh, yet we are willing to uh, go on with business as usual despite of the number of warnings that we have, right? And it's in this context that I think this particular talk makes a lot of sense. Uh, the, this paper by Devika is not structured like other essays uh, which looks at institutions per se or looks at how that impacts environment, but rather the study integrates into the environmental psychology, local history, and the uh, powerlessness that is there within institutions. So now I'm going to hang, hand it over to Vika and uh, I look forward to the talk. Thank you. So thank you, Lavanya. Thank you very much for this invitation. And I must uh, say that I'm not really a, um, someone who's done, a, has a history of, uh, you know, research, a long-standing research in environmental issues. So I, I always have had a, a deep interest in environmental issues, particularly the struggles that have uh, arisen in Kerala since the 1980s. I've been part of those struggles and I've supported those struggles actively as an academic. Uh, uh, nevertheless, um, this opportunity came to me, you know, to actually uh, take a close look at one of the oldest uh, struggles for environmental safety in Kerala. That that which is, has unfolded in uh, this little um, town called Elur, which is uh, close to the metropolis of Kochi. Um, in, since the 70s, one is familiar with civil society interventions against industrial pollution, chemical pollution of the river Peria at Elur. Now, I wandered here, you know, I, I um, my work is largely in history, but then at a certain point of time, I veered towards development studies, which is, of course, a interdisciplinary area. Much of my work has been on history of development and politics and culture intertwined. And um, when I took over the, um, uh, the responsibility of the research unit on local self-government in Kerala, uh, I had a chance to, to look seriously at the environmental impact um, of uh, 
local self government actually what local self government has been able to do uh, as far as the burgeoning uh, destruction of the environment i mean since the 1990s interestingly enough uh, we have seen a, a, a terrible intensification of uh, uh, environmental damage uh, due to uh, a host of reasons and uh, Part of the work of the research unit on local self-government is um, concerned with this. Now, um, my um, this particular work is looking at local self-government in Elur as well. It's looking at, and let me say that the whole paper, in fact, the whole monograph, where well, this is a part of a series research series that we encourage researchers to do along with journalists. So it's usually a journalist researcher team who does this research and writes together. So uh, this the first of this, what I'm presenting here is the first of that series. The second is by Lavanya and her, uh, you know, her uh, and, and, and Suchitra, uh, who was a journalist, and that will be appearing soon this year. Uh, this, the full text of this is available on the CDS website. So just, uh, um, I will uh, send you the link later. Uh, on uh, in the chat so anyone who wants to read the paper in the full and in fact the whole monograph in the full is welcome and i we will be of course uh, quite grateful for the comments this is a chapter in that monograph and it was authored jointly by myself and dr n c narayan at uh, iit mumbai and uh, just to introduce elu to you um, uh, elu is an industrial hub you know it's a uh, it's been an industrial hub uh, known for chemical industry since the 1940s. It's very close to Ernakulam, that is Kochi, in the district of Kochi. It's barely 20 kilometers away from Ernakulam. And it's, as I told you, it's one of the oldest it's sites of struggle for environment safety. Uh, there are tons of reports. Actually, you know, there was no need. When I first told my colleagues that I'm going to do this, Piece of research, the immediate response that what do you, why do you want to do more research? What you need is more action. You know, you have had enough of research. There are tons and tons of reports uh, from all kinds of disciplines. You know, including uh, uh, you know science, in, including uh, scientific the scientific uh, disciplines, um, and the, and the sad reality is that this mountain of research has is uh, he has obviously fallen on more or less deaf ears. So uh, in 2018, for example, 2015, for example, as near as 2015, the Periyar at Elur um, uh, turned a different color at least 44 times. So you can imagine that the effluent discharge uh, beyond acceptable safe limits was at least 44 times. There were 23 massive fish kills in the Periyar, that's one year. And um, it continues during the uh, devastating floods of 2018. Again, the area turned a different color because taking advantage of that, even uh, the industries just dumped more and more toxic waste into the river. Now, this area, um, in at least in the 1930s, was, of course, just like its surrounding areas. It was a rural farming, fishing-based uh, economy. Um, and uh, well, though they have that that economy is almost completely gone, to be replaced by the industries, massive number of industries, so or huge ones. You know, for example, the fertilizers and chemicals industry of Cam Travancore FACT once hired twelve thousand people. Now that has fallen to two thousand. So the industries are failing in that area. Other industries used to hire ten thousands of people which now only hire hundreds of people. There are also studies from the 1970s that reveal illness, you know, all kinds of illness. So worst effect, and of course, the worst victims of these illnesses are ine inevitably the residents of the SC colony uh, who reside on the banks of the river. You know, and in fact, the, the, they live on the banks of the worst polluted stream, uh, which is called the Kurikanda border. Creek. Hmm. No action from authorities. In fact, in, you have, in, despite all this, despite so much of public attention, so much of international attention, uh, surprisingly low uh, amount of uh, uh, 
uh, action from the authorities and and the scene has only been worsening uh, in in the in in the new millennium there was a fire in the creek um, out of from burning of tauline and tauline is a toxic uh, chemical discharge it was discharged through uh, a, an unauthorized effluent pipe in the in the sand insecticide factory the pollution control board and as well as other public authorities were largely ineffectual though public indignation did grow and there was a, you know public there was a movement that, that came up against it i'll speak of more of it later this is just by way of introduction so there were protests and there were protests there have been protests in the 1970s and they grew quite uh, vocal in the 1990s and in 1995, a writ petition was filed in the Supreme Court, and it led to the Supreme Court issuing notices to all state governments and central and state pollution control boards um, to identify problems caused by the hazardous waste dumping in the jurisdiction. And uh, and the and then it received really no um, uh, you know substantial response. The Supreme Court appointed a high power committee, uh, and when this was happening in the mid 90s simultaneously in kerala there was decentralization political decentralization happening and the well publicized people's planning campaign was on but, you know and the people planning campaign actually gave some space for local people to voice their demands uh, and uh, and the first governments were set up the uh, the uh, uh, popular governments were set up at the local level, and they took up some of these issues. Again, we will discuss that. At that. So the late 1990s looked as though things were changing on the ground. Uh, well, uh, that was actually a quite a short-lived phase. In fact, that phase was also particularly hopeful because suddenly international attention came to to Elur. So the Green Greenpeace took an active uh, interest, and in 1999. There's a study conducted by Greenpeace found it to be one of the top six hotspots of the world. Uh, several groups of since then, several groups of researchers from many parts of the world have done, uh, you know, all kinds of research on the pollution levels at Eru and, and also have found tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous health risks to people residing there. So all kinds of systemic diseases, including nervous, muscular, circulatory, and even, even a higher prevalence of infectious diseases, or higher rates of cancer, prevalence, mortality, birth defects, asthma, uh, all kinds of things. So in finally, the Supreme Court's intervention took the shape of a local area environment committee in 2004, which gave local uh, civil society i mean local oppositional civil society that is uh, the uh, the environment movement in that area a substantial voice for the first time so they were part of the activists who had been following the pollution issue and protesting it for at least 10 years many of them became part of this committee and this committee actually did a series of checks uh, under supreme court ages on these on these factories and came up with substantial recommendations and the, its writ actually was respected in the area and for two years pollution cleared up. In fact, things seem to be changing for the better in that area. However, what happened is that very soon, due to political interference, uh, this the work of this committee was wound up and things have gone back. Why number one since then? So when, uh, when we uh, undertook field work in ELO, things looked like uh, you know, really bad. I mean, the movement had taken a uh, uh, beating. Uh, local support for the movement had actually waned considerably. The local self government seemed also very well uh, unable to do anything uh, substantially and also uninterested and in denial. In fact, what struck us most was the denial of it because we had actually looked at the Panchayat Development Report, the Panchayat Development Report of 1996 which was actually produced out of the Grama Sabha meetings. You know, several Grama Sabha meetings were conducted in the Elur area and the Panjayat Development Report was some, a summary of all of the different demands made by the Grama Sabha. But, and in those, uh, uh, in that report, people have, have been actively voicing their concerns about chemical pollution and demanding that it be scaled down. 
without, of course, loss of, loss of employment and so on. But definitely they were demanding that the question of pollution um, must be taken up seriously and that it was indeed destroying not only health, but also livelihoods and so on. And, you know, everyday well-being. However, this, this insight seems to have completely managed in our interviews. We interviewed a very large number of them. Now, Elur is a municipality. At that time, it was a panchayat. So the municipal corporation members, we, we interviewed a very large number of them, plus a number of important government functionaries, political party leaders, local people affected by the pollution first. I mean, the people who live on both sides of the Kurikandam Creek, as well as the activists. Uh, the most prominent activists uh, in that area. Uh, so one thing that really struck us in in this exercise was the denial of, uh, you know, the uh, the effects of environmental damage. So most of the members did agree that there was pollution. Uh, yes, there is pollution, but for them, uh, the they were agreed more or less that the pollution was too bad. It wasn't well. Yeah, people are falling ill too. Yes, there is cancer. Yes, there is asthma. Some, some people, in fact, one of the members uh, who was born and raised in Elu said that there were three cancer patients in his house and he had chronic asthma since the past 30 years. And he still said, oh, but that's all right. I mean, pollution is not really the problem in Elu. So then, uh, now this was a curious uh, thing for us. So we, our study, we decided to focus on three questions. One was how to understand this widespread denial of vital, you know, vital uh, issue of pollution and if, how to make sense of this indifference, even if you don't call it forgetfulness uh, of this issue. That was one, one question. The second question was about uh, the local explanations for, you know, the, the complicity. So how, how, what are these local explanations? How do people understand this whole phenomena? So, um, I mean, if you if you set apart this, we we realize that it's not enough to just fall back on the usual explanations of corruption or complicity of local leaders. You know, the usual. I mean, what you would if you if you develop it academically would become a political economy kind of understanding. It's important, yes. It's it it is it is there, no doubt. But that is necessary, but perhaps not sufficient. And secondly, uh, we wanted to ask a question. Um, despite the anti-powerful, very powerful anti-pollution movement, the people were not so, you know, enthusiastic about it. Why? Why did people not really connect with the um, with the Periyar Malinikarana Viruddha Samiti? That is the Periyar Malinikarana Viruddha Samiti. That's the so spearhead of the anti-pollution movement uh, in Elur. And thirdly, what explains the inability of the local self-government to intervene in effective? So this, these are the three questions. And of course, the answers to these three questions are pretty detailed and long. And I don't want to be taking too much time, you know, telling you all that in great detail. It's there in the monograph if you, if you want to look at it in detail. Uh, I mean, I'll be very grateful if you can read it and give us some comments. Um, but I will try and um, you know, quickly uh, round up uh, our observations. So firstly, uh, so um, there is, uh, as I told you, there was sufficient public awareness and acknowledgement of the problem of industrial pollution in the 90s. There is no doubt. That seems to have disappeared. So that is the interesting thing. So most of the members of the municipality, you know, the elected members, insist that it is a thing of the past. Though so there is there are ample resources that show that it is a living reality there. It's something that frightens people all. And in fact, it was really in the news. In fact, after we finished this research in the floods, the devastating floods of 2018, you had people coming out in large numbers to complain about this. So uh, it is not as if the it is a thing of the past, but for the municipality uh, members of the municipality, elected members, it's they, they gave us all these strange explanations. So we were trying to understand these responses. And one way we thought we could make sense of it was to look at environmental sociology and psychology, the insights coming out from the denial of climate change research, you know, the, the research on people's denial of climate change. 
it is now of course a very important theme in environmental sociology and psychology so of course uh, this phenomenon of denial is one in which people that is even victims deny the destruction despite incontrovertible evidence of the same that's what denial is about so the responses that we collected at elur came close to what is called socially organized denial you know in the climate change literature that is and it's it it seemed to be working against what is called the information deficit model it's not that people don't know or have enough information it's not really that knowledge this knowledge is quite and so it also you know highlights the fact that knowledge bringing new knowledge on environmental destruction to people is a very necessary exercise but somehow that alone uh, will not prompt people to acknowledge um, of course climate change or uh, environmental destruction as we saw in elo so in fact there is now a powerful argument in this literature that a flood of information can actually trigger denial than the other way around as a form of grieving you know and there might be you know internal defenses that they may activate in fact uh, environmental psychologists uh, many of them act, argue that a flood of information you know more and more information of destruction and death and all that can activate what is called distal defenses you know so um if they point out that um you know, uh, death thoughts can can be extremely um, scary you know for us for human human beings so uh what they do is then um activate what is called the distal defenses and these distal defenses then make us deny Uh, this uh, uh, the reality, uh, even when it is presented in in very very good factual form. Of course, I mean I am not denying that there is corruption. There is the political economy. The political economy angle is huge, and we'll come to that. Um, uh, the trade unions, for example, are extremely powerful uh, player in this uh, in this whole story. So uh, it's a very important angle there. Corruption would be part of it. so also would be ignorance and fear no doubt to that but here we are not talking just about ordinary citizens we are talking about elected municipal councillors you know people with power people who are uh, quite aware of the issues and are not so powerless for sure they are not intimidated they are all except for a, a few except for one person who is from the environment movement all of them are affiliated to powerful political parties in the state and they're quite powerful so uh, ignorance and fear are uh, cannot be uh, you know uh, that way important uh, so analyzing these interviews and i i was i was very excited um, by ernest becker's theoretical insights into uh, human beings repression of death thoughts you know and that's what uh, seemed to explain uh, the interviews uh, so well uh, i i found it very illuminating because according to him you human that thoughts can be either proximal that is accessible to the conscious mind or distal which are uh, in, in inaccessible to the conscious mind and each of these is dealt with in a very through a very different set of defenses and defenses are obviously endogenous drivers that uh, control death thoughts and death anxiety in our in, in human beings so when death thoughts are proximal we tend to display a distance or distract them one way or the other uh, and when they are distal that is existing world views uh, such as individual group identities and uh, are fortified are, are as such fortified and uh, this is what i can actually uh, intensify um, out group antagonism so this leads to creating us and them kind of responses like we are on one side they are on the other they are wronging us all this is, everything is going wrong because somebody else is is creating the trouble for us so uh, such defenses are often uh, often give rise to counter intuitive intuitive responses such as indifference to a burgeoning pollution you know? so uh, this latter kind of defense that is this distal uh, fear of death is quite conspicuous in this interviews and despite conscious effort not to fall into these us and them frameworks the, the this is this was a big contrast between the interviews with the 
elected men the municipal council members and the uh, activists in the municipal council members interviews we found these digital uh, uh, defenses activated in this us and them frameworks so they want they speak in black and white they say that the activists are all anti industry anti uh, you know growth um, the usual stuff while we are all pro growth uh, pro industry etc so there is no common ground they can only be us and they can only be them and uh, uh, however uh, if you look at the proximal uh, uh, threat perceptions those are also quite ab abundant and in fact uh, uh, a large section of the paper has to do with uh, identifying the strategies you know the 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 psychological strategies by which these proximal defenses seem to be working uh, as i mentioned punya uh, please deal with him I'm sorry. It's this is the, uh, our pet who's creating some trouble here. Uh, uh, so uh, these defenses, uh, the proximal defenses, as I mentioned, uh, have to do with uh, uh, you know proximate. I mean, the death threats are proximate. They are accessible to uh, uh, to consciousness. Then they are usually deflected in some way or the other. so a large part of the paper actually surveys these different strategies i'm not going to i mean if we have the time we could have discussed all this but and i'm sure you can read it in the paper or during the discussion maybe we can discuss but we identify several of these strategies i'll just give one line on each uh, the first is that uh, is well um, is to say that we are respond we are not responsible others are so identify some other group which is responsible you know like for example the case uh, the pollution control board or uh, something or the other the upstream polluters the tea plantations in the hills which are polluting so why only us why don't we all blame them uh, why don't we also get them to take a share of this blame so this is deflecting the argument the uh, second uh, strategy is to say that the future is more important pollution is in the past let us talk about the future now that's a very common response again to uh, to claim that um, you know it's air pollution air pollution has been solved well it's not been solved they've set, set up largest tallest stacks so the uh, the polluting content is now directed somewhere else uh, with the wind blowing that side so that's uh, that's another way of deflecting the whole question uh, and uh, the third uh, argument is to say that oh this is mostly all pollution and all illness everything was mostly in the past so it's not in the present so even if we don't talk about the future let's just uh, you know let these past things are past so let's not uh, pay them too much attention and fourthly there is this uh, um, uh, this the response which says the body will adapt saying that the human body has this infinite capacity to adapt to any kind of circumstances so if you live sufficiently long in now this is medically incorrect as we know and and interestingly enough some people who may who said this had chronic patients in their homes husbands for example who had married into uh, elo so the woman says that oh you know when he when we married and moved into elur uh, my husband started getting asthma now it's around 30 years now he is okay his body has ad has adapted to that so how that happens etc is of course he's is on a ton of medicine so i was curious so we probe but well, it turned out that he's like he's on drugs more drugs and there are some drugs now which seem to be working for him a little better then the uh, fifth uh, uh, response was of of this this proximal sensing the uh, defense kind of response was to say that oh we keep the place very oh, maybe the chemical industry is a polluting as well but we keep the place very clean we are very mindful of waste dumping in up and this is they are talking about domestic waste so the moment you talk about waste they will catch on and tell you that this what matters is really domestic waste. and we are very keen we are a, you know top municipality as far, far as dealing now these defenses now if you look at the literature on uh, on uh, climate change for example it is clear that these defense these kinds of defenses are not limited to elur they have been identified worldwide uh, 
and uh, but however, then it, we, are, we had to go on and ask this question, what triggers these defenses in, in the elected members? So what, does it, what exactly triggers? Because environmental psychology also has a theory on what uh, not a theory, but several theories. Becker has a theory uh, on uh, what triggers these kinds of uh, defenses. So uh, for this, however, then you have to move into the local history of the spatial transformation of Heilun in the 20th century. Now, in the heyday of uh, Nehruvian industrialism, Heilun was a place that was deterritorialized and re-territorialized as uh, Udyoga Mandal. You know, Udyoga Mandal is how you now in Elu the post office is called Udyoga Mandal. The uh, PO is Udyoga Mandal PO. And Udyoga Mandal in Kerala was understood as the, uh, you know, as the domain of industry. Udyoga in, in Malayalam means a job actually, by the way, uh, employment. Uh, but of course, it, uh, in Hindi, uh, the, the translation that is given there is uh, the domain of industry. You know, the space of industry. So that, in fact, for a long time in Kerala, Udyoga Mandal in the Malayali imagination represented modernist national space. Earlier, that is in the 1930s, and it, it was composed of nearly 41% of paddy land before the industrialization, and 20% of farmland, and around 12% of homestead land. And nearly 30% of it of this was un uninhabited. And Elul, by the way, is an island. It's an island in the period. However, if you visit Elul, you will never get the sense of it being an island. It's been so altered spatially. The first bridge uh, uh, in, in Elul uh, was built in 1955 uh, when the industrialization gained pace there. Since then, now you have 11 bridges. That convert that can connect Elur to uh, to uh, the Ernakulam district uh, to both shores, and uh, you will never get the sense of living on an island if you live in Elur now. It used to be, I mean, the Elur um, as an area was under the Brahmin uh, uh, elite landlords uh, in the 1930s, and uh, in the late 1930s, however, when large-scale industrialization took off in the erstwhile princely state of Travancore. Elur was identified as an ideal location because it was on the Periyar and the swift currents of the Periyar could uh, carry the timber logs from uh, the, the deep forests uh, to, break, to build industrial units. So it, it was also uh, clearly having you know, ample access to water and the hydroelectric plant, the first hydroelectric power plant that was set up in Travancore would provide electricity. So chemical industries were supposed to be ideally suited to uh, for to this uh, uh, to this uh, area to Elu. So the earliest factory, the earliest factory was an aluminium factory. It was set up uh, there in 1939, and then under the Divan um, of that time, Sir C. P. Ramaswamy here, the uh, the <coughs> the uh, fertilizers and chemicals Travancore was set up in 1947. Uh, in 1944, actually, and it became uh, it was announced to be Udyoga Mandal actually before Nehru. You know, in 1944, it was already identified as the uh, place of industry. In 1944, the Travancore Cochin uh, chemical. Uh, then uh, the Binani Singh uh, factory in 1950, and in 1950s, you have several other new factories arriving, Hindustan insecticides, as well as the FACT undergoing a very huge expansion uh, through the 1950s and in the 1960s. Now, the transformation of this area was clearly then um, due to non local factors. So I mean, the generation of uh, electricity from Pallivasal, the hydroelectric plant, uh, that was one of the conditions. And the second was, of course, World War, the, the Second World War, and the food shortages that it engendered, which led to this push to food, towards food production, increasing food production. And uh, at that point, uh, fertilizers and chemicals were, uh, you know, a vital part of the imagination of the 
of agricultural intensive agricultural and and uh, cp ramaswamy ayer was driven by such a vision now in by 19 uh, by 2005 this small area of something like 11.21 square kilometers at 300 factories huge 300 factories and these changes completely altered the ecological features of the region it undermined uh, the pre-existing sense of environment and spatiality almost totally this is clear so this is very clear from the interviews because most of the interviews were with people who were born and raised in in this utopia you know this heterotopia of um, a modern indian industry so uh, according to uh, you know uh, so yeah so if you um, if you look at the physical changes um, well elur is a very very um, very particular very unique kind of a place in kerala where you have division of the the very early division of space between industry and democracy in 1950 so industry was given large large parcels of land so 500 600 700 acres of land large parcels of land um, and uh, the industrial area of course was uh, you know governed uh, internally so there were no access to uh, representatives of democracy into factories very large boundary walls there were roads that uh, ran through factory compounds which were in it have been always inaccessible to the public is still inaccessible uh the roads in that area have always been hogged by factories going into and coming out of uh the industry the factories um and uh, generally you know, you know and the fact uh, the fertilizers and chemicals travancore had this huge township inside so it was a living world inside completely different world inside a really modernist fordist kind of world inside the factory walls while uh, the outside even outside the public roads etc were completely you know for meant for industry so either governed by industry or for industry so democracy there was actually quite peripheral uh, in the 1950s and so on and it, right now even now the new road to the vallarpadam container train to the kochi container train terminal by the sea that is the vallarpadam uh is outside the control of the local self government so you know uh, so even the decline of industries has not really helped democracy some ways <laughs> mm -hmm. the uh, local self government has absolutely no control over these roads and so on inside the factories or now even outside so um, now the dominance of industry of course had its long term impact so agriculture in that area shrunk to near non existent so there were dips and and that was not just because the industries grew but because of gypsum pollution huge amount of dips, gypsum were uh, disposed of uh, from the factories and it just filled up the fields and destroyed agriculture then people lost free access to wild areas um, in fact wild areas more or less were gifted to the industry so the everyday use of water bodies or even public bathing ghats became more and more difficult public fishing for example uh, was common in elu because fish was so abundant and that was now gone uh, and industrial and industrial areas of course of course besides that industrial areas extended uh, continuously uh, ponds and especially over water bodies and that is the interesting thing they and it was built over water bodies or the water bodies were literally taken over to dispose waste uh, so and of course when we all heard about uh, pollution in elu in the 1970s it was all about air pollution initially so the uh, there was a lot of protest there in the 196 late 60s and 70s and uh, uh, groups like the kerala shastra sahitya parishad for example produced pamphlets on this uh, air pollution early in the 1970s then the river pollution protests actually started in 1980s and it, because it started getting worse uh, there was there were bunds built for example in this area called padalam the bund was built on the river that made the river pollution unbearable because pollutants now hung around the river much more and the rivers movement slowed down in that area however all this seemed to be compensated by this modernist life 
that was made available to the workers in these factories, and particularly uh, FACG, which was known for offering really good housing, uh, welfare benefits, and even a lot of opportunities for aesthetic culturing, um, like Kathagali, you know, training in Kathagali and so on, and uh, drama clubs. And MKK Nair, who was the civil servant who, who, who you know, created this modernist heterotopia in uh, Elur, he was known uh, to encourage workers uh, uh, aesthetic pursuit. So many of these workers were, became known poets and dramatists, etc., in Kerala at that time. So it was quite a quite a you know uh, interesting place at that time. And of course, more importantly, there was a large informal sector that grew around the township. So all kinds of people who sold hawkers and peddlers and uh, you know dobies and all kinds of informal services and and uh, services and goods uh, offered uh, around. So that built the economy of Elur in a very different direction from what it was. So the industry, however, was the key employer and the provider of all kinds of employment. Everything revolved around the industry, and as a result, all other skills. For example, this area was known as a place of for skill where skilled woodworkers had settled. Kochi, skilled woodworkers who originally came from uh, Southeast Asia, Malaya, Malaysia and Indonesia, they were supposed to have settled around this place. In fact, their descendants still uh, you know, engaged in um, skilled woodwork. They moved out or they, they accepted factory occupations. And so such things also vanished. And then of course, large numbers of contract workers began to arrive from the 1990s onwards and most of them from various regions from Bengal or East India particularly. So now, uh, so from the, uh, in fact, from the uh, interviews, uh, the denial or indifference or whatever of enormous pollution may be strongly related to the re this story of re-territorialization of Elo by the nationalist developmentalist imagination. Uh, this, as I told you, Udyoga Mandal was a space of nation building in Kerala. Uh, the fertilizer, fertilizer production, of course, was, uh, you know, I recognize an eminently nationalistic kind of enterprise in the difficult 1960s. So you have, you know, and if you if you read the uh, the article, you will find more details about how this imagination persists in the interviews. So you have. You know, there, there's a memory in memory of uh, these employees, these interviewees. It is the fact township that is the object of intense uh, nostalgic longing. You know, it's not the lost natural world. So, in fact, uh, in Becker and others point out to the importance of nostalgia for nature uh, in, uh, in, 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 in in your responses to uh, environmental destruction. So they. The, they point out here it's very clear that these people who we interviewed, these are all young, they all grew up in Elur, they are nostalgic about, not about really the lost nature of uh, most of them at least, are nostalgic not about uh, uh, nature in Elur, uh, but uh, to the loss of this, uh, you know, the, the fact township, you know, the modernist fact township. This great sadness at its present state. So, for the liberal intellectual culturing that it offered to all gentle, you know, the genteel Nehruvianism, uh, the uh, you know the the kind of the roads, the wide roads with Ulmer trees on either sides, and uh, the orderly housing, the hierarchies, even um, all of it is you know in the in the um, imagination of the workers. Uh, so, you know, and so they, they lament the present of Ulu, of, of Elu. So some called it the graveyard of industry. Some said it was like an abandoned cemetery. And somebody said very tellingly that it was like a crumbling Nalikata. Nalikata refers to a feudal home, you know, a feudal homestead, that is. Uh, the homestead of a, a feudal lord. Uh, Nalikata. I mean, Nalikata can mean also uh, a middle class uh, or, or not, sorry, a non landlord house. But when you usually use it, this uh, crumbling Nalikata usually refers to a place which was once a great seat of power and culture and tradition, which is all now destroyed, lost. So, this is in striking contrast with the, uh, the interviews with the act activists. Because a number of these activists, and with the, so with the exception of one member, 
who comes from a Dalit community, who was not a elected member, who's a, who's a member of a Dalit community and a long-standing activist. With just he, with, with his exception, all the other members are nostalgic for this township. But if you, in, but the interview with this particular member, this uh, Dalit, uh, Dalit man, who was also an activist, who, who was then elected a member, him and the other activists did not show any nostalgia for this township. For them, the nostalgia was definitely about meat and its bount bountifulness. And interestingly, a very large number of these activists came from either Dalit or, uh, uh, or other uh, groups which were actively engaged with the, this ecosystem for a livelihood earlier. So fishers, you know, uh, people, uh, activists who came from Fisher families. This uh, the, the, this Dalit member himself, who was a farmer and a Fisher, uh, and uh, many such. They, they all had connections, livelihood connections with the earlier natural world of, and they deeply mourned the loss of that world. So, in 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 some in some ways, this local history of Elu. Um, uh, points to the formation of an ecological habitus uh, that has persisted into the present. Of course, despite and this gradual loss of the conditions of existence from which this habitus developed gives a, a better sense of the various psychological defenses that, that are, attacked, are attacked. So in some ways, you know, I, what, what we did was to look closely at these psychological defenses and then look at the local history of the place to see how to to understand how like, the changes in the space the, uh, the spatiality of the place may have triggered these defenses so in some ways um, the nostalgia for the modern father like industry at elur i mean the, the whole description of elur as a crumbling parawar you know lacking a you know a senior man a karanavan a senior male to take care of it. That is, MKK Nair is so deeply rooted in the imagination of these uh, interviewees because he's like a father figure, a lost father figure. So the, the local self-government, the elected members of the local self-government are mourning the loss of this father, of this father figure. Uh, and they feel that uh, the industries who have inherited uh, the, the, I mean, the, the industries who have inherited this Maliketa are simply not good enough managers of that region, of that whole area. So, uh, in fact, uh, in some ways, this nostalgia for this modern father-like industry at Elur serves the same function as, you know, the anticipation of the future. They're forever thinking about the future, of what it will bring. Uh, it serves to deal with this powerlessness, um, which seems to be characteristic of the local uh, governments there. Now, uh, coming to the environment struggles at Elu. Uh, sorry, Tinta. Uh, sorry, Tinta. Devika, could, uh, could you conclude? We're kind yes, of running yes, out of time. Right. Thank right. you. Yeah. So I'll just, uh, because you see, as I told you, this is a large paper. So I'm, I mean, I was, I intend to stop here because this is, uh, well, this is half the argument. Then uh, the rest of it, you, I mean, you can be, I think this argument will stand by itself even without the other parts. So the rest of it, very briefly put, is uh, it's about the environmental struggle and, and we were trying to compare it with the Talia uh, struggle, you know, the pollution, uh, the anti-pollution struggle at Talia, which is far more successful than uh, the Periyar one. And trying to think on why that grew into a mass struggle, successful mass struggle, including the workers and everybody else, why this did not, and or, or why the Chalapudi River uh, uh, struggle was much more successful than this one. And uh, the, finally, we look at the local self-government and why it has, what are the structural issues uh, which have made the local self-government so powerless, despite the fact that at its start, uh, the local self-government in Elur did start with some very promising uh, signals uh, towards ending uh, industrial pollution. So that is really the substance of this paper, you know, the summary of this paper. But I will stop now and we could, well, um, if there are questions, I'll be happy.
Shall I look at the chat box? Thanks a lot, Devika, for uh, reading. Uh, so I would invite everyone to please uh, type your questions in the chat box. Or if you want to ask your questions, uh, just let me know and uh, I'll call your name, then you can uh, turn your microphone on. Yeah, that was a really fascinating talk. I, I really enjoyed reading the paper, and it's so nice to hear you speak again. Uh, so till people start uh, uh, typing questions, there's one question that I, I was wondering if you could take. Uh, in terms of scale, right? So you talk about the local governments. You also talk about pollution, where in which interviewer, uh, the people you interview talk about pollution from uh, above or the big industry. But we're also talking about pollution at the local level. So this idea of scale keeps coming into your uh, study. So how do you deal with that? Uh, by local level, in pollution, the local level, you mean the you are muted. Yeah. I'm on, I'm on mute. No, I, I'm not on mute. Oh my god, am I not audible? Uh, no, it's coming. The beginning was. Uh, I could hear the beginning. No, I, I'm just asking. <laughs> Now, I'm, I just want to ask, uh, what uh, how could you just make it a little more clear on what you meant by local time pollution? Did you mean domestic pollution and small so, scale in pollution and so on? So I was thinking of terms, in terms of scale in two, uh, two ways. One, in terms of the institutions of governance themselves. right? Hmm. So your main, uh, uh, the people that you interviewed were basically from the municipality and from the panchayat who live in Elu. Hmm. Now, they kept talking about uh, the idea of pollution being elsewhere, mm -hmm. right? Being other, being far uh, away. Uh, yeah, yeah. But the consequences do not. So how did how did you uh, see that within this idea of the heterotopia? Well, uh, the industrial heterotopia is something that is vanishing now. You know, it was quite vanished. It's vanished. It was once. It is no longer. It is only in people's imagination, and that was a nostalgic memory. So that does, in fact, the, the reality of pollution clashes with the heterotopic imagination with such violence that these, distant, these kinds of defenses seem to be triggered by it. Well, that's, that's very interesting. We have a nice question by Neeti. It's in the chat. If you want, I'll read it out uh, loud. Uh, Neeti says, very interesting comments about distal response that led to denial yeah. despite enough information. If information about negative impact of climate change cannot motivate action, then what strategies can we use for climate change action? Now, uh, you know, the point is, in fact, Becker and others point to the point to the importance of the metaphor, you know, on, on how metaphors are what really, more than factual information, it's metaphors that change Seem to have lost her. Yeah, it's uh, frozen. Okay. One minute, I'll try to contact her. Yeah, take your time. If everyone could just wait for two minutes, I'm trying to get in touch with the speaker. Sorry about this. Sorry, the Wi-Fi dropped. That's why I had to. I suddenly. I welcome that. I will basically. All right. Uh, so, could I read out the questions? Yes, please. Yeah. 
Uh, you were answering uh, Neeti's question. Would you like to? Uh, yes, about uh, metaphor, right? Yes, yes, yeah, about metaphors and environmental humanities, right? So you know the um, environmental humanities. One of the things, uh, for example, Amitabh Ghosh's work, um, for example, you know the, the kind of impact that literature seems to be making. Uh, in bringing the environment, nature back into uh, the imagination of human imagination. In some ways, we are so alienated from nature. Uh, it's um, you know, in 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 uh, to bring it back into the human imagination and you know, make it part of your subjectivity. That is, I mean, that uh, the problem is that uh, nature is no longer part of people's subjectivity. Less and less part of. Uh, uh, middle class elite subjectivity. So to bring it back into that imagination, I think it is metaphor that is going to play a very important role. Um, well, of course, there is no question that you need more better imaginary, uh, I mean, information, etc. But for people to take an interest actively in that information and to act on that information, I think the, the fundamental psychological transformation uh, will uh, come only through metaphor. And that's why you have Arayana Guru and I have always wondered why the seers, the great seers, always spoke in poetry. You know, they never wrote down boring things. They always sang. Whether it's Meera, Mirabai or Saku or you, you name it. In Arayana Guru. Philosophical insights all came. In fact, from. I think. Yeah, Baba has quite a related question. Uh, so she says, I haven't met heterotopia before and wonder exactly how it represents the other spaces, activities, when the industries are needed for contemporary economic, economic yes. development. Yes. Uh, her chat may not be visible to you if you... It was uh, had, earlier. Yeah, you, left, well, you left and came back, right? so it tends to remove oh. the earlier chat. So she is saying, That's I also good. wonder at the extent to which uh, you have described the dystopia. Please, could you develop the relationship between heterotopia and denial? Well, uh, the uh, heterotopia is not a dystopia. Heterotopia is a space and imagines it, it is a, in fact, it's not even an imagined space. It is a space that is consecrated to an idea. You know, in some ways, like you, you know, you, you, you mark out that space and that space then represents a certain idea, some kind of an idea. In, in a full-blown sense. So uh, that way, heterotopia, Elur became a heterotopia for Indian, Nehruvian, you know, the imagination of industry and everything that was Nehruvian, you know, the genteel Nehruvian liberal uh, culturing. You know, there are these interesting stories about, uh, we were told that how this was the only place that uh, every every day, every um, uh, there was a driver who we interviewed, you know, who, who, who had retired from FACT. He said that his job was to drive every day to to Coimbatore, you know, to get copies of the Hindu hmm, for the uh, elite members of uh, you know the uh, the elite managers because they are the only people who read the Hindu and. He was so proud when he said that. He said that was a level, you know, people, the, ma the management here would send a car every day to Coimbatore to just get the newspapers because newspapers were so important. That how, so that Nehruvian it was. That was the impression. So that is heterotopia for you because heterotopia is a place. It's a real place. It's unlike an utopia. It's not an, it's not an imagined place. Unlike a dystopia, it's not some kind of imagine nightmare, you know, hell. This is a heterotopia is a place where an idea seemed to have condensed, consecrates, consecrated there. So that is heterotopia for you. And the, the loss of this heterotopia, the fact that people see that it is crumbling right in front of their eyes. And, and you remember this heterotopia did not have much space for nature, you know. The Nehruvian nationalist developments is flame framework definitely did not have any nostalgia for nature. So the people of Elur, uh, the interview, uh, all these people, especially the members, the ones who, who we, who the activists who have been fighting for nature in Elur are not people who were involved in this heterotopia, who, who did not share this imagination, that heterotopic imagination. So that was a big difference. 
I, I, because I didn't see that. So I Rajeshwari know. has a, a related question. Uh, so uh, Rajeshwari's question, can you see it? It's right on no, top. No, I can only say about. No, I can only see her comment to Nagraj. All right. So uh, Rajeshwari basically asked something that's quite related to this idea of denial. So she was saying that environmental loss is an expected outcome of industrial states, right? Is it just the denial that is worrisome? How is Elur different from Telco or any other industrial estate of the late 20th century? Well, Elur has a very long history. That is, I think that is a big difference. Elur has a history that goes back to 1930s. So a whole generation has grown up in a, in, in a place where nature is really thickened. And this is rare for Kerala. In Kerala, you will not probably not find it anywhere else. Uh, so it, there is this long history of, of being a part of a Nehruvian project. So that is the difference between Elur and other parts of uh, uh, other, uh, what should I say, other uh, industrial estates, I suppose. And that has an impact, I think, on the people who were raised there, to grew up in that particular place. So it's a, that way it's a... Uh, and obviously, expectation of loss, yes, of course. Uh, but then again, um, I don't think, um, well, this complete loss of, um, uh, say, for example, the fact that you cannot imagine to yourself to be living on an island anymore, for example. I don't think people bargain for that. I mean, I don't think people could fore foresee that. But that, that is not really the problem. The problem is that people who were born and raised in this in Elur, which is the space of nationalist, nationalist, developmentalist, industrial imagination, can, cannot, are finding it hard to cope with the fact that this dream has not materialized. It is actually crumbling and dying. And it is under attack also from like people, ecosystem, and descendants of ecosystem peoples in that area. So they cannot stomach that criticism. They are not able to take it psychologically. Not consciously. So they under if you give them all the facts of pollution, say oh, there have been like fifty studies on pollution. Actually, there have been more than fifty studies of pollution. They say, yeah, 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 true. There is pollution and all, but the effects of pollution, well, yeah, that is exactly you cannot cause so much. Yes, I've had the asthma for thirty years, but this is not because of pollution. Now, this is for how people respond. So uh, I think everybody's really fascinated by this idea of denial. So uh, Vandana also uh, uh, had a related question. So she's saying climate oh, scientist yes, and ecologist Steve Running. Can you yes, see it? Uh, Vandana, Vandana? Singh. Uh, uh, Vandana. Steve I'm wondering about... Yes, yes, yes. I mean, this is, this is the literature that I am pointing to. It's a very important body of literature for us, I think. This unacknowledged trauma and resignation, yes. This is, this is an important argument in that literature. There's more than that in this literature. And I, I have been fascinated by Ernest Becker and, his, and all the others who have developed his ideas. But uh, Steve Running is also an important contributor to that literature. Yes. So prior to that, Nagraj had asked, uh, he had asked, so at the end, uh, you are from contrasting struggle in Edlur with others. Uh, most of the struggle you mentioned. What did you have in mind? Could you That's not there or not. Right? So oh, here, uh, here are, no, no, Nagaraj. Nagaraj has asked, at the end you had talked about successful struggles, right? So he uh -huh. wanted to know, could you elaborate? What was the difference? What was the contrast between the Elu struggle and those? Oh, yeah, the Elu, see, in, it's interesting because in Elu, you had, basically, you had, as I told you, mostly workers, you know, many of not industrial workers, these are workers outside uh, the trade unions, who uh, were, you know, basically day laborers and others. The industrial lobby was very, very powerful in Elu, you know, and they have stubbornly refused to take on board any of the suggestions of the local area environment committee has, and also in the later. They, we have continued to perpetuate this denial of uh, uh, of uh, the effects of pollution. Now, in Chaliar, in Chaliar, it's interesting how the struggle came from. The struggle was mobilized initially by the panchayats, and this struggle is the oldest in Kerala. You know, the Chaliar anti-Chaliar struggle, pollution struggle. The 
that started in the 19, uh, 19, early 1960s, after the Grassen factory began to pollute the Talia River very, very uh, seriously. At that time, the Panjaits that were, remember, that was not the time of Panjaiti Raj. Panjaits were not powerful bodies. They had nothing like the constitutional mandate they, they were given in the 90s. Nothing of the kind. Despite that, it was the surrounding Panjaiti, five or six Panjaiti presidents, who first, you know, called for a movement against this. And they are the ones who started mobilizing people. They also managed, and this is very different. See, for example, there you had Grasik, he had Birla for an outsider who had come and set up. You know, there was, this was, a, this was private sector be it the support of the government, but it was a private sector industry and it was a loan industry and it was by a, a known, you know, capitalist. So he could be easily placed into an outsider framework, outside, outsider intruding framework. Now, in, however, in, in uh, Helu, that kind of imagination was difficult to mobilize because this was the, you know, the fruition of the nationalist dream of industry. So this was public sector. FACT is a huge, supposed to be the pride of Kerala, right? So, um, and in the Hindu, all these other industries were largely public sector. So it was very difficult for the boom and to mobilize. And if you look at Chalia, the, the other struggle, the Chalakudipura uh, Samrakshana Samiti struggle, there they had ecosystem people, the Tadar, ecosystem people, they are support that essentially prevented the hydroelectric plant from hydroelectric uh, um, uh, uh, production of hydroelectricity at Adirapalli. It is the, the support of the ecosystem people. In Elu, you did not have anybody. You had only had the descendants of the ecosystem people who were the backbone of this movement. And again, in Elu, if you look at the way the movement developed, their, their support came largely from outside, you know, from uh, global uh, forums like uh, like UN, they when they spoke at UN forums, for example, they also they had support of Greenpeace and many other agencies, and the and the and the support of an of a major uh, 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 arm of the uh, government, which is the judiciary, the states, uh, uh, an important arm of the state, the judiciary. So that movement in Elur was propped up by these things and. Because they were uh, involved with such institutions, they were more uh, inclined towards producing more and more factual information, reports, you know, more and more stuff that would satisfy these forums. So the, the kind of work that was done in the Silent Valley struggle, for example, so on the one hand, you had very factual, extremely scientific information. On the other side, you had poets and uh, and writers and all kinds of other people making all this cultural, uh, you know, creating a you know a new language, a poetic language for the struggle. This happened simultaneously for the, the, the Silent Valley movement. It did not happen so in Elu. In Elu, there was a lot of reliance on the global forums as well as on the judiciary, which required the uh, the movement to produce more and more information. I think that was important. That, that difference is very important. Devika, you will have to look at the chat because my internet went away and all the chat has disappeared from my chat box. So you'll need to scroll up. I'm sorry. Let me. Uh... Uh, Naga, you can help. Naga, could you help, please? My yeah, chat yeah. is empty at this point. Yeah. Let me just see what we already done. Dirka, can you see the questions in the chat box? Just in case I've missed somebody. So Manjeet has a question. Uh, Devika, are you there? Can you hear me? Devika? There as well. Uh, maybe she had the same connection problem. Uh, she seems to have frozen. Please just give her a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that, folks. No, we don't have Devika with us. Uh, Lavanya, you may, you may have to call her. Yeah, I'll call her again. One second. She must be Please. connected. Naga, I'd like her to extend what she was saying just now. 
Yeah. Uh, I've asked a question in the chat box, and she, as I was typing the question, she was talking about what happened in Silent Valley between the different kinds of discourses, scientific and the literary, uh, on both sides. So I'm just thinking that you know she's saying that these things are coming back. Uh, the the literary writing on issues of the environment are coming back. So what does she think is a possibility in terms of? Bringing and whether that can inform or can be evoked by the political, hello, political yeah. imagination, uh, political mobilization as of now is the kind of question. So uh, I just spoke to her. She said she's she'll be back in a few minutes. So the internet has dropped again. So she's just reconnecting. So if you can just wait for a minute, she should be back. Sorry yeah. about this. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm here actually. Hi, Devika. So, we can hear you. Yeah, the screen is not uh, is stuck at oh, no. uh, the opening place, but I still can hear you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we can hear you very well as well. Uh, so uh, Nagraj, could you just read out the questions? If, yeah, uh, I'm just wondering I... if Devika, if Devika can hear us. Maybe people can just sort yeah, of. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, can I ask a question? No yeah, in the okay. in the order. Yeah. So why not Manjit? Why don't you just can you just share what you are saying or shall I read it out? You please uh, read it out. I can hear you actually. Okay, okay. okay. Please read it out, Naga. Okay, so Man Manjit said, says, uh, uh, rich in local opinion, and I have many questions, but if you briefly tell me about a possible classification of these opinions, uh, maybe you have said that and I missed it. It's talking about I did say that. I did say that it will take. Uh, I I uh, kind of listed it. Listed these opinions into five different types of proximal. You know, proximal defenses. Five different ways of deflecting. Now this uh, in the chat. I I, I mean I've just added a link into the chat. If you want to look at the uh, the document from which I just presented, uh, the essay is in this book. It, you can download it if you want. The PDF. Okay. File. Thanks. Thanks, Devika. Yeah, that will do. Thanks. Yeah. I think now John had a question. John, you wanted yeah. to come in? Yeah, yeah. Ask, yeah. See, it is the yeah, only yeah. thing is, uh, see, with this uh, M K K Nair, and uh, uh, you know, he is supposed to be a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, famous uh, bureaucrat of those days. Uh, is it a case that this uh, Elur uh, units which came up did not have the facility to treat the effluents before they were discharged to this? Uh, the reverse around. Now at one point, no, at one point it did, you know, because the demand made by the environment movement there has not been to close down the industries. It has been to update the technology. Yeah. So the Supreme, the Supreme Court's, uh, you know, the, the, the litigation ended up in the Supreme Court demanding that all these industries, uh, you know, ensure that the waste is properly treated before it is uh, sent off to the river. Yeah, for that, so that did yeah. not happen. Now that did not happen. That was supposed to happen along with the, with the participation by the municipality. And of course, it would involve a lot of money. So there was all discussion on how much money the state government would have to contribute, how much would come from the center, how much the industries would have to contribute and so on. All this ended up, so nothing has moved on that front. So there was a lot of talk, even in 2017, the municipality was pretty hopeful that, that, that this might take off because they had meetings around that. Nothing has taken off. The Pollution Control Board, for example, all the people we interviewed there, they kept on saying that uh, there is a desperate need to update the technology. And, in, and the activists are at pains to convince us that they are not against the industries. They want the, play, the industries to clean up in the sense that there is now technology. It's not as if chemical industries have no technology to clean up their waste. They do have that. The, the industries are actually failing, as I told you, national Public sector industries are, are having a difficult time um, uh, making ends meet is what they say. They say that uh, the, uh, they are loss making units mostly and they don't want to really spend much more money on that. And the trade unions are pretty adamant that they will not allow anything that will jeopardize their jobs and their benefits.
In fact, uh, leading a, one way to attempt a proper political economy ana analysis, I think the work of people like Beck, you know, uh, Ulrich Beck, etc., are now very, very significant. How we look at the organized sector, um, uh, the organized sector workers, you know, what kind of, what kind of, uh, you know, if you look at the destruction of nature, destruction of that of, of nature uh, by capitalism, what kind of a place you would assign the industrial worker in that frame? Uh, there are interesting, uh, there is interesting work in political economy on that, and also in sociology, like the work of people like Ulrich Beck. Uh, so Rohit Jha has a question which focuses on the spatial approach to development. He says, hmm. could you highlight any measures adopted by the village residents to the local governments to counter the spatial approach to development? Another question is by incorporating the environmental aspects in planning to help us to challenge the spatial restructuring. Now, uh, we have, in, in the, at the end of this paper, there are, we have, my co-author and I, we actually talk about the classic, the river basing planning, in the boundaries of local self-government, etc. for environmental planning, they, they may not be just relevant at all. So, uh, my co-author, who, who specializes in uh, water, in, in research on water, uh, he, he argues that it's important to bring back and see uh, river river basin uh, river basin planning or that actually imagine soft spaces you know of, of planning that uh, that is able to cross and administrative boundaries uh, political boundaries etc more easily so he advocates that um, in Pelo because like uh, some of the interviewees point out the problem of pollution intensifies in Elo. yes that is true but it actually it is it is actually exacerbated by uh, say the the sprinkling of pesticides in the tea plantation up, up tea plantations upstream. So uh, if, if there is no uh, real imagination of this as a uh, the the end point of a river basin, then uh, planning is not going. Environmental planning will not be effective. That's uh, that's been one argument we are trying to make. Uh, the other um, point is about resistance, uh, how people are resisting. Well, you know, as I told you, well, the striking thing about Elur is the lack of resistance. Now, the 2018 floods were so severe that, you know, the water entered the go-downs of these um, factories. Some of them, like, the, were shut down, actually. They, they were closed uh, for you know, the following protests, etc., some were closed and um, I mean, nothing was done. I mean, the industry, uh, the managers just got out, pulled the power switch, went off. Everything inside the factory was just like that. So when the floods of 2018, they just, uh, the water just gushed into all these factories, including the go downs, and got thoroughly polluted by this water. This water obviously entered homes and, you know, habitation places, schools, or you, can, you cannot imagine how terrible it was, how, how utterly sick and unwell people were. But there was, you know, the, 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 the protests were feeble. I mean, there was hardly anything to be heard. And uh, nobody seemed to be even thinking that a place like Elur might be affected worse and different. So that, that is the mystery. That's what we are trying to really find out. You know, why is it that people don't see? Despite all these claims about, you know, the movement in Elur going to, you know, global forums and all that. Anish Manayak, Manayak asks, you mentioned a shrinking of employment to the factories and the labor unions that remain are part of the denialist establishment. Two current and former workers have similar articulations of nostalgia for the past and as the leaders. Or are there differences between these? So, you know, the current workers, a very large number of them are contract workers, you know. So they are, they don't speak the language, they don't connect to local people, and they are really not, they they really don't connect to ELO. They have no nostalgia for ELO at all, you know. In fact, they, they don't mind whatever happens to the place, you know. So they are nostalgic neither for the nature of ELO nor for the industry in ELO. They are mostly non Malayalis. They are from Bengal and Orissa and many other places in India, and they intend to move on, you know. 
so uh, there is no such prospect but earlier uh, generations are very nostalgic for the lost industrial heterotrophia um, i mean there are in fact some of it is like the visual images that they created of elur of the 1960s uh, it's so engaging you know i mean and you could see the even if you did not agree with them uh, the power of their imagination was remarkable you know one of those people said that at 4 at 5 o'clock the in front this is massive square like place in front of the fsct factory gate is huge the fsct factory gate is like a huge massive monument in itself so it's a big square in front of it there used to be a bigger square at, at one point and um uh, this person who used who used to be a hawker there he told us you should have seen elur in the 60s in at 5 o'clock this place was like a temple festival it was a temple festival every day with a thousand to with 12000 people thronging there at that time and he said business was so brisk all the time you know he was he is a beauty maker he used to sell beauty So he 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 was so eloquent about you know the festival like atmosphere and about how you know the children of workers uh, in elur played on the ambalavail grounds and um, and became top footballers in uh, kerala or how the uh, the udyogamandal drama club uh, won the, uh, the kerala state uh, dramatics trophy kanchkon continuously for 3 years how the kathakali school in the elur the fact uh, township uh, was one of the most successful kathakali schools in kerala oh, again i mean i can go on on and on so this this lost world something that constantly haunts and that's that is, and they want this you know father figure to come back like yeah, mk kinayar is like a god there even now mk kinayar is like some deity so he's highly respected and respect is a is actually uh, to tone it down you know to say to use the word so amani panna ganti is adding to vandana's question saying that the toxic reminds me of rob nixon's concept of slow violence could the gradual and invisible way in which toxic pollution and its harms persist i'm just thinking of health harms like cancer and asthma do they play a role in normalizing and desensitizing people to the adverse environmental impacts yeah that is a very good uh, uh, i think that's a very good um, uh, point uh, i i totally agree and in this paper there is uh, we quote one of these activists who who compare the, the lack of response you know the whole uh, res- the lack of response of local people to this issue to domestic violence you know so i think that makes a lot of sense um, with what you just said he, he says this particular activist he says that it's like some housewives who have got so used to violence every day you know they've been beaten every single day of their lives they feel terrible if the husband doesn't beat them so he says that people in elur have become like that the slow violence slow regular violence over time seems to have normalized it you know seem to have made made it like really just part of every day so the the kind what it robs from you what it takes away from you doesn't feel to you know terrible or the loss is not felt that acutely so you're right So let me move to a question lower down. Madhulika has asked before I go back to questions about. As she says, loves the talk. I'm intrigued by the contribution of literature that you refer to. Is it possible that some way of creating new coalitions and movements by evoking that literature rather than old style political language? She does say. I cannot. Like, I cannot agree with you more, Madhulika. I think it's a more general thing. it's not just about environmental struggles i think the revival of democracy in india the revival of human decency in india leave alone democracy depends on new metaphors depends on igniting uh, the human imagination nothing else is going to save us i am certain about that in kerala for example the endosulfans the, the struggle around endosulf mass mobilization happened around a novel a brilliant novel 
by somebody called Am Ambika Sutan Mangad. This was a novel which actually said, told the story of the struggle itself in that region, in Kasargod. It's called Enmakage. Uh, so in, in, uh, it's been translated into English. I've translated that. It's uh, Juggernaut published that novel. And that novel was really the rallying point for people from other parts of Kerala. Because Kasargod is a small, tiny little district in the north. It's a cusp culture, you know, it's, it's, it's between Karnataka and Kerala. Half of um, a lot of local Kannada, Kannadiga cultures, not just mainstream Kannadiga culture, but a lot of local Kannadiga cultures, South Canara, you know, all these cultures, as well as Malayali presence there. So it's a, it's a kind of a space that is very rich culturally, but ignored by the tribalist kind of orientations that we, you know, nurture so assiduously in our democracy. So it's that kind of a place. And um, so the, to draw attention to that place itself was a terrible uh, job. And uh, Amika Sudan's novels just, just uh, brought a very large number of people. You know, it's in English, it's called Swarga. Uh, that, that novel is called Swarga. And it kind of, it weaves into, it, it really, it's a kind of a post-human tale. Uh, and that is what in, inspired people to join the struggle, actually. So I totally believe that environmental humanities is going to be a vital discipline for, uh, for the environmental struggle. And in general, the, the, the incitement of the metaphor is what is going to shake people out of the stupor. So just a couple of more, uh, one comment perhaps and one observation. The comments from me were just sort of, con sort of contrasting the denial of climate change, which generally goes by quite a long way and precedes the current times when these impacts have become more obvious and is often time, not always, but often infused by a conservative politics. Whereas in Elur, you know, the dynamic seems quite different. Uh, hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Now that, I think, you know, that I think we need to look very closely at the, at the theorizing of the industrial working class in the West. As I told you before, if you look at uh, Ulrich Becks and others' work, they actually look at uh, the, I mean, how, I mean, they pose this difficult question of asking, uh, which asks about the role of the industrial working class in sustaining the exploitation of, of capitalist exploitation of nature. So what is this secret compact that the worker, not, not secret, this unstated compact that the worker has, the industrial worker has with the capitalist when it comes to the, uh, the, util the use of nature as a resource for capitalism. So, you know, how nature is used, there seems to be a, you know, a silent agreement on that. And that might come out in much more uh, richer, in, in very uh, in flagrant colors in, in, in a place like Elu. So uh, the first Panchayat president, for example, who, in fact, I told you in the 19, early, late 1990s, there were some, some glimmers of hope that the Panchayat would actually do something. So I actually did deny a, a very, very um, vicious polluter, you know, the Merkham plant, uh, 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 an industry license. Of course, the Merkham happily went and got the Kerala State Pollution Board to, you know, to give them the permission. So that was easily done. But the Panchayats Act was a very important one. It was really exercising the powers that were given to it by the, uh, the Panchayati Raj Act. And this man, who, if you look at this monograph, uh, one of the uh, chapters is about, is an interview with this man, this Gangadharan Menon, Gangadharan Nair, I think, or Gangadharan Pillai, whoever. He was the Panchayat president uh, of Elur. Who, who headed the committee that denied this license to Merkham. He is a trade unionist and he's a Pakka believer in this kind of large scale industrial industry. He really doesn't really care much about the pollution issue and all that. But he said that at that time, the pressure of people was so high. If the Pandai committee had come out without giving this kind of a decision, they would have been beaten up. So it is not their, the, their distance from the industry. It was just the fear, because at that point, as I told you, due to different reasons, the movement was strong there. So they had to acknowledge that. So the industrial working classes' relation to capitalism is something we need to rethink in the light of the Anthropocene 
as well as the you know instances of persistent in the environmental destruction as in Elo. So there's a last sort of question from from Anish, a last question on the, on the, the, the chat box, which I think you partly responded to, but please sort of he says you was wondering about whether and what with the local political coalitions that came together successfully in the late 1990s and earlier, or were these moments of more active environmentalism also largely top down, Greenpeace, International, etc. What would be involved in building such coalitions again? That's the last question. I think, yeah, I think now we have, I think uh, one of the issues in the 1980s, the 1980s environmental activism in Kerala was um, very largely middle class. Because you either had this romanticist, I mean, which was called romanticist, that is. And I, I, I really do not like, um, as I told you, because I believe in the power of the metaphor, I don't uh, like using the word romanticist as a pejorative, in a pejorative sense. Uh, well, you had these streams, you had uh, the poets um, on the one hand, who created a certain language, um, a poetic language of the imagination. You, know, you had the more technical kind of people uh, who were more interested in cost-benefit analysis and producing a um, lot of information. You had these streams. Both, however, largely addressed the middle class, the educated middle class. Issues were also in the 1980s were posed as such. For example, the issue of water shortage, the issue of electricity, you know, um, cheap electricity, etc. In the 1990s with neoliberalism, there is a big shift because this middle class is able to buy itself a little higher. You know, into, they, they can buy some more time. That was evident. And the important, the victims of environmental destruction, which actually intensified in the 1990s, are because of the predatory, you know, the predation, natural resource predation went up so much with consumption and the construction industry becoming a mainstay of the economy. Uh, the sufferers were largely ecosystem people and the marginalized poor, uh, especially the lower caste poor who lived on, you know, who had to be evicted, whose land was affected when uh, there was the quarry industry became. It's these are people who are who are absolutely marginal to the um, you know, educated middle class. Uh, so to reach them, you had to create another idiom, and the and you could no longer. Avoid the fact that these are also environmental justice struggles. So you needed to re redo your language totally, but that is still not done, unfortunately. Thanks, Sujita. It was a fabulous talk. I was really looking forward to hearing you again. I knew this talk would fit into the series that we've been having uh, in Teachers Against Climate uh, Crisis, and um, everybody's enjoyed it and. We really thank you for uh, your erudite uh, uh, explanation. And uh, I, I love the fact that it's so grounded. And I think that's what makes it very powerful. Uh, all right, so everyone, uh, thank you all for being a part of this uh, uh, talk. And uh, uh, if the is all right with it, this talk will also be on our YouTube channel. Please do subscribe. And uh, please do write to us if you want to know about further talks uh, in this particular series. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Devika. Yeah. And I Thank would like, I mean, I, I want to really request um, everybody here, if they have the time and the interest to take a quick look at this, uh, see that the, the, the document I shared, because that's going to be a series. Lavandias is going to be the next in that series. <laughs> so, <laughs> and give us your comments, uh, especially on the design, because I want it to be an attractive, uh, uh, I mean, it's boring to have just a book of letters. You need, you need images also. So please do take a look at it when you can. And um, please let me have your responses. And wonderful to meet Nagraj again. If I remember, the first time I met him was in a meeting um, for Tehri, if you remember. It was against Tehri Dam. It was in your hostel mess, you know, where a group of us grew, came together to think of uh, some joint response. So wonderful to meet you again like this, Najat. So hope we meet again. Absolutely, Devika. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for a rich talk and discussion, really. Stay in touch. And if Thanks. you come to Trivandrum, definitely be sure to visit us. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So can I leave now? Is it possible?